If you have your Bibles, let's look at it from verses 8 through 20. Hallelujah. We're going to do a little bit of reading. I know it's going to be long. If I see my Umi, I'm a little bit of 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 a little bit Oh, my. 
Alpha Alpha Y Mona Loto, on the phone in my level, 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 my way. Oh, be in my father, I never talk. Oh, no, be a woman, or a to follow my mother, I am a child, or I am a child, I told him. Amen. I can make one at a wolf for your child, and they were too like my girl. Can make for your Maria, what I offer you, Opa Uma, Maua Mafa, Fau, why not a lot? Lacey, me for me, you know, a woman of a matan like the little mamma for me, who are all, but will not to be vidi, my fafi tie in their tour, or no mea uma, will not to fa a long way, mava ay yai, pay on a ta, who are my yarting at all. Tie all new to fear tell a noise to help with our pair, ear tail win a low lotto, lay wing a morning or the Christmas. Ear tail win a low lotto, lay wing a morning or the Christmas. Treasure in your heart. The true meaning of Christ. Luke 2, verse 8 through 20, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. They were keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with an angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary, and they found Joseph, and they found the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard were amazed. All who heard were amazed. Say amen. amen. All who heard were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured these things in her heart. Mary also pondered them with her heart. The shepherds also returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This morning, the message is simply this. Treasure in your heart the true meaning of Christmas. Because sometimes when we tell the story of Jesus, it's become so plain and boring because we do it every year that we lose our sense of awe. We lose our sense of knowing that this is an important story. And sometimes, like I said, in the busyness of Christmas, we lose our wonder. We lose sight of what it really means that Christmas is more than just gifts. Christmas is more than about getting together with family. Christmas is more about figuring out how many people you got to get cards for and what you got to do for the kids and what kind of food you got to cook and all of these preparations. And in the midst of this busyness and all of this preparation, we forget that the real reason for Christmas is Jesus. And I know you hear it. And in fact, there's a lot of teacups out there that has it, right, that says Jesus is the reason for the season. In fact, even the secular world starts to use that, not as a way to promote Jesus as the true reason, but so that they could sell their teacups. But I'm praying that as a church, we never lose our sense of wonder, that we never lose sight, that if it wasn't for this special day, that if it wasn't for this son, that his name is Jesus Christ, we wouldn't be celebrating the salvation that we have each day. We need to remember that church. 
And I know it's the story that everybody knows. Everybody knows. But I love it. When you look at Mary and you see it says here that Mary, out of all people, everyone else, they were amazed. But it says Mary treasured this in her heart. And the reason why I want to bring that out is because there's nobody else who really understands the true meaning or has an inside knowledge than Mary. Because Mary is the one who's dealing with all of this. And you think about the story and how it all started. Here's an innocent girl. An innocent girl who is a virgin. And here she's betrothed to Joseph. We know the story. And then I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. Think about it. How do you understand this? And I want you in this morning, just for a moment, put yourself in her shoes. And you think about the situation that she's in. Betrothed to be married. And now there's an angel saying, you have a child. Now, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out how that happens. But here, Mary is asking, how can I be with child when I have not known a man? And I want you to think about that. Because she's asking a logical question. If you look at it in the terms of a human being, we understand that how child comes about. But the idea here that an angel says, you will have a child. And the angel, the, the, the Bible says that the angel told her, this is how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will hover over you and God himself will plant this child in you. Now think about that. And I want you to think about it. It's scary news to her. Because if you know, in Jewish culture, it was a big, big no-no, even in our culture, for any woman who's betrothed to a husband to sleep with another man and, of course, become pregnant. And you think about that. And you look at what's going on. Again, I'm telling you, I want you to really think about where Mary's situation is. Because I'm telling you, you look at Joseph. If I was in Joseph's shoes, an angel came to me and said, that the, Lord, the, the angel visited me and he said that I am going to give birth to a son. You know, if I was there and I, you look at the story of Joseph, I would say, Mary wasn't no special person. She was just a normal human being living her life. How did she come and tell Joseph, uh, I, I know I'm betrothed to you, but I'm with child. How are you with child? An angel came to me and said that I'm with child with the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Bible said that Joseph, he didn't accept it. The Bible said Joseph wanted to quietly divorce her. But you know what changed Joseph's mind? The angel had to go and tell him as well. And here's the thing that I'm trying to tell you. No one could understand this. That's why when the Bible says that Mary treasured this in her heart, because she knew the inside story. She had to be the one that had to look like a fool. She was the one because, of course, to all of, I mean, imagine telling everybody that she's ready to give birth, but yet she's not fully married to Joseph. It's a crazy story. It's a crazy thing to hear in those days. In fact, in Jewish culture, the only thing that was meant for someone was like that was, number one, she's a liar. Number two, she needs to what? She needs to be stoned to death. Because in the mind of men, she committed adultery. 
But in the story of the Christmas story that we read, it was the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit who can do such a thing. And when we look at this, again, it requires faith. That's why this story is an important story because, again, it requires faith to understand what God did on this special day. Because without faith, because this is a spiritual matter. And if you're not in the spiritual mindset, you cannot grasp what happened here. But by faith and through the spirit that lives in us, we understand that, yes, the Holy Spirit brought Jesus Christ through Mary. And so we understand that as this important story again. Because again, what a crazy thing. But in, in her eyes, she's the only one who could witness all of this. And the angel told Joseph and everything that God and the angel told Mary, it fell into place. To the point where now even strangers were coming to see her. And the shepherds were telling her the story. And here she's listening to all this. All she could say to herself is praise God. Because at the first I would have looked like a fool. But thank God that everything that he has told me. And because I believe everything has come true. And so today again like I said. I want you to never lose sight of that. Never to lose the importance of what is happening. Because when we look at this again, it's about Jesus. Say amen. Yeah. It's about Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is the reason. Jesus is the reason. When you look at that, we say, what does it mean, Jesus is the reason? It was in the midst of darkness. It was in the midst of trials. It was I lay off and my lawyer took your lay to a say, I'll wait for you, ya asa. May Fayatu ya, I will take a polis and may tassi, a letter no may a letter of my lazy luna, I hear far more and more my yatia. Lazy la men of Fayatu, I lawyer to a ya say, a Fayatu ya, for my fessi, my sefailo. I learn a tattoo for a long of a maya, for my tala asa silly. Lay say, I'm out of Fessilia to a nephew, but not for if I own no letter to her. I Instead of joining God, he said, I'm going to join the enemy. And if I can get the enemy on my side, then perhaps he can protect me from Israel and Syria. And here we have this story where God becomes angry because he says, look, you're an evil king to begin with. You, you sacrifice your kids to, the, to, to false gods. You bow down before false gods. You're one of the worst sinners out of all the line of David. Any king that have come about, you're one of the worst kings. But even though, even though, God is with us. And I want you to understand because it's not in the midst of happiness. It's not in the midst of joy. It's in the midst of darkness. It's in the midst of chaos. It's in the midst of war. It's in the midst of confusion. And all of these things are happening. And the good news comes out. A virgin shall give birth to a son. And she will name her. Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is one of the things that I want you to think of when we think of the birth of Jesus Christ. He's representative of the light coming into a dark world. Say amen. 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 
o le atua foi le loko o i a lava sa i le atua le amatanga na faya mea uma lava e le ai foi se mea tasi na faya e le faya e ia le la fa mei fai upe fa sa i a te ia le ola o le ola foi o le mala malama le o tangata o a popula mai foi le mala malama le po liuli ai fa mei o le fa alave alave le e le ita li le po liuli le mala Jesus Christ is number one when we think of him, the light of the world, the light in the midst of dark times. Because like I said, this message that we preached about last week came amongst in a dark moment. It came amongst in a time when nobody was really focusing on God. But here, if you look at it in that same book, Isaiah 9 verse 2, it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. It says, on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The question is, who is this light? The verse 6 on the bottom says, for unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. This is the light of the world, church. This is the light that even in the midst of darkness, even when we were sinners, because that's what the Bible says, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was nobody seeking after God. There was nobody looking towards God. Everybody was doing whatever they wanted. And it was in the midst of this, whatever we were doing, God loved us so much that he demonstrated his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. What does that tell us? Nobody was really looking for God. Even in the time of Christmas, nobody was looking for God. Maybe except for the three wise men, right? Maybe except for the shepherds. But even the wise men, the only reason why they were looking for God, because they had studied ancient manuscripts. The only reason why the shepherds were looking for God at that time was because an angel had to come and tell them. But the truth of the matter is this church, nobody was looking for God. And yet God still showed up. Nobody asked for an answer, and yet God still provided an answer. This is what I'm talking about when I said, even in the midst of Ahaz's craziness, God still provided an answer. Because he could have changed his mind. He could have said, you know what? You want to do that, King Ahaz? Then forget it. Go do what you want. But he says, you know what? You do what you want, but it's not going to stop me because I'm still going to demonstrate my love and I'm going to send my son and he's going to correct what the first Adam me uh, messed up. So again, think about what's going on here. God, if you look at that, two things that I want you to look at. We talk about how there's a light, but that verse is for us. For unto us a what? A child is born. And then the second verse says this, or the second part of the verse says, To us a what? A son is given. Two different things that's going on. It says that a son will be born, or a child is to be born. Number two, a son is to be given. What's going on here is Isaiah is trying to, dis, uh, to really break down the idea of the deity of Jesus Christ. That he would be 100% man and 100% God. Because when you look at the first part, it says, For unto us a child is born. A child in the sense of a baby. A baby comes from the human aspect that we understand. And so in that side, a child is born is talking about the human nature that Jesus would have. Amen. And then when it says in that second part, a son is given. The question is, whose son? And so the other aspect of that is not only is the light coming into a dark world, but God himself is putting on flesh. God himself is stepping into our territory. 
You know that saying where we say, oh, uh, you know, you're arguing with somebody and you're thinking to yourself, you shouldn't even talk because you don't even understand what I'm going through. Right? You ever have that? Say man, no, not everybody. You ever have that one person who's always like, you should do this, 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 and yet they've never even experienced it. They, they give thousands of advice, they give all these little things, and it's like, have you ever been through this? No, 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 I just typed it up on Google. You know, it's that idea that they never really know what we experience. And here, we cannot say that about God. You know why? Because God stepped into our story. See, God can relate. Sometimes we think, oh no, he's a distant God. No, he's not a distant God. You know how close he came? He was born in a manger. And we forget that. We forget that. See, God has every... I mean, of course, we know that he's the creator. He has every right to speak into our lives. But more so, if you're going to argue and say, well, he doesn't know what I'm going through, he was born. And if you look at the Bible, the Bible says, and you look at the story of Jesus, do you know how you can see him in a man's eye? Was he hungry? Absolutely. Did he eat? Yes. Did he sleep? Of course. He was so tired, he fell asleep. That's how you can tell how tired he was, that he was sleeping on a boat that was rocking back and forth in the midst of a storm. The only humans do that. The Bible says that he was also what? He was murdered. And when they killed him, what? Blood came out. When they pierced him on the side, blood came out. And the, way, the reason why I'm trying to explain this is because we have these uh, 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 Gnostics who think that, 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 that Jesus didn't really come down in the flesh. They believe that Jesus only came in the form of a spirit. But I want to tell you that when you read the Bible, if you were to poke the side of a spirit, nothing would happen, would it? But blood spilled. Spirits can't eat. Spirits can't really sleep. They just float and do whatever they want. But a human being, he eats, he sleeps, and if you happen to pierce him on the side, he bleeds. Amen. And what I'm trying to tell you is, yes, if you still have trouble believing that Jesus was an actual human being who walked on the earth, you look at the word of God, understand this, he was born God with us. He was the word. He was the Logos. Logos. And we talked about all this, all this time. Let's see if you remember. What does Logos mean? Logic. The logic, which means reason. the reason. And if we say that Jesus is the Logos, we're saying that Jesus is the reason. The reason for our existence. The reason for our being, the reason why he created us is not so we can do whatever we want. He created us for him and for him alone. And this is one of the reasons why we celebrate him. This is why we need to remember that Jesus is the light in the dark world. That the story of Jesus is the good news that we've been waiting for. Because again, if we don't understand the bad news, we'll never understand the good news of Jesus Christ. And again, I want to remind you that not only is he the light, he is the word become flesh, but he is also the reason for our existence. He is the very reason why you and I are here. And you look at that because even in Colossians 1 verse uh, 8, it says that he said, for all of us were created. He created all things for him, by him, and for him alone. And so if you look at that, Jesus didn't make us so that we could just do whatever we want. He has a purpose. He has a will. And that will, just like he says, is for us to be salt and light in the world. Is to imitate him and everything that he has done. As he stepped out of his glory and came into the flesh, the reason why he did that was so that he can be an example to you and me. So that he can show us, not just tell us. And I love that about him. Because when you look at the story of Jesus, he didn't just tell us what to do, but he showed us what to do. And I love a person who not only speaks, but also walks the talk. Yes. And that's what Jesus is, because when you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 1, this is what Luke writes. He says, Theophilus, I'm trying to write this story about Jesus so that you can see all of his deeds and all of his commands. Two things, all of his actions and all of his commands. 
Amen. Jesus is not just someone who tells you. Jesus is a doer. And he is an example for you and for me. So if we ask, why should I follow Jesus? Why should I care about this baby Jesus? Number one, because he is a light. And we live in a time of darkness. And if you are saying, no, it's not so bad, Pastor, then I ask you, sit back again. Ponder in your hearts. Look at what's happening in the world. Look at what's going on. Look at everything that's happening. Some of us, we pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the world. But I want you to, I want you to remind you this morning, the reason why the things are happening in the world is not so we could focus on its negativity, but so we could remember that we have a Savior. That we have someone that is greater than some of the politicians that are in, in the house right now. See, don't waste your time worrying about a president, worrying about anything. You have a king of kings that you serve. And this king of kings, the Bible says, the government shall be on his shoulder. Not this president, not this vice president, not that chairman, not anyone, but on the shoulder of Jesus Christ. That tells you that he is a what? He is a mighty counselor. He is a wonderful counselor. Meaning that he is the, I mean, if you need help, there is no other counselor. Stop asking the world, stop asking your friend, but go to Jesus Christ. He is a great counselor, full of wisdom. He will tell you what you need to do, how you need to do it. But a lot of times, instead of seeking the wonderful counselor, we look after our own counsel. We do what we want. The next verse is that what? He is a mighty God. We sang about it. Huh? But you know, it's one thing to sing about it, and then it's another thing to understand. That's why some of us don't sing it, because we don't understand the mighty God that we serve. You say, well, pastor, how do you understand the mighty God that we serve? Spend time in the Word of God. When you read the Bible, it's about God, it's not about us. A lot of people make the Bible about us. Yes, God was pursuing us, but it's not about us at the end of the day. It's about God and His love for us that when we were unlovable, that when we didn't care about God, God loved us anyway and He sent His Son for us. That's what this story is about. The word of God, it's the power. I'm telling you, spend time. You want to know more about faith? You want to know about how God did this, this, and that? Spend time in the Word of God. It's what's going to transform your thinking. And that's what the Bible says, right? Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind so that you can, what? Test and see God's good and pleasing will. But you cannot test God's pleasing will if you're busy renewing your mind with the rubbish of this world. That's why you don't worry. Now here's the thing. You look at that and you use it as a sign to tell you Jesus is coming soon. Amen. But you don't look at that and dwell on it thinking, oh my gosh, all hope is lost. No, this is our hope. And one day he's going to come back and take his church home. 
Jesus is our hope. He is the light of the world. He is God in flesh. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. That's why it says, Mighty God, the other thing says, The Everlasting Father. Ah, let me tell you. When you are two of the people, 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 forever. We sang it. The Alpha and the what? The Omega. We give him all the glory and honor because he's what? He's the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha meaning what? The beginning and the end. But here's the thing. Don't get it confused. It's not that God has a beginning and that he has an end. He has no beginning. He has no end. But here's what that is saying. Everything begins in God. Everything ends in God. That's when we sing that. We're not saying because even time itself, God's not, he's not limited to time. God holds time in his hands. That's why Jesus said, when the disciples said to Jesus, What is that saying? That's saying that Jesus doesn't even know the day and the time that he will return. But only who? God. Why? Because again, time is in God's hands. He is not limited to time. He has no beginning. He has no end, but everything exists, begins, and ends in God. Amen. And that's why I tell you, in this time, in and that's what I'm telling you that's what matters the most you can live a great life some of you are longing for a stress-free stress -free life some of you are longing for no problems but I'm telling you you can live a stress-free life and have no problems but if you don't have Jesus that's a big problem because when you die what matters is which side of the eternity you'll be in so I want to fact I want you to get on the other one for me and I want you to don't get don't get me wrong giving gifts hanging out with the family they're beautiful all I'm asking you this morning prioritize and put Jesus first Eh lo fa ya tu o fa le al ma ki wa lo mi si si fa le fa pia le wo fa me fa fa o o ko fa me alo fa le wo fa me fa fa o ngo ngo fa no no le le ka na or me le tum fa ya tu fa pia ko me alo fa he will always be here because again, Christmas comes and go. But Jesus, our hope in Him, it will remain forever. That's why we call Him the Everlasting Father. Yes. And not just an everlasting God, the key word there is Father. Father in the sense of what? A relationship. Whenever Jesus spoke to God, and let me help you understand, nowhere in the Old Testament, except for David, but nowhere in the Old Testament has anybody ever referenced God as Father more than Jesus Himself in the New Testament. <laughs> And, and, and when Jesus is setting the example, he's trying to teach us something, church. You can call God your father. Amen. You can trust God as your father. And when you look at this relationship, I want to help you because some of us, maybe we didn't have a good relationship with our father. But I want to help you. Do not equate your physical father to God the father. Amen. And so I encourage you, how is your relationship with your father? That relationship, because I don't know about you, even in my own, you know, relationship with my son, 
I'm praying that I will spend a lot of time with him so that I can help direct him and guide him as he grows up. That's that relationship that God is looking for. That relationship that I'm going to protect my son no matter what, that I'm going to love him no matter what, God has that same love for you. And you want to experience that again, your relationship with God. The word of God in prayer. Say amen. amen. Then the other thing he says is he's the, the last thing. He's a prince of peace. I'll close with this story. Uh, I don't know. Uh, some of you may know it. But in 1914 during World War I, they called it the Christmas Truce. It was in the midst of a battlefield where the, Ameri or, uh, the Americans and uh, the Italians were fighting against uh, the Germans and all of the other guys. I mean, it was a war, and it was getting close to Christmas Day. And they said, the story goes that no bombs, nothing, but on the 24th, everything stopped. Instead, you could hear from each side of the trench Christmas carols. People were starting to sing. They were starting to pull out pictures and talk and reflect about Christmas. And for one day on the 24th, there was no fighting. And in fact, on the 25th, the very day of Christmas, the story goes that the soldiers were even bold enough to come out of the trenches and meet in the center of the field and started exchanging stories, talking about Christmas and how they missed it. And if they were home, this is what they would do. And they started exchanging stories and for two days, there was an absolute Christmas peace. And you look at that story and it's inspirational. A lot of journals, you can find it anywhere. A lot of stories tell them, you know, you, you, I've heard this in high school. I've read it in places. They'll teach it in history and social studies. And they called it the 1914 Christmas Truce. The time when they decided, stop fighting. You know, and you think about that and you think, what a wonderful uh, illustration of peace. <coughs> But then the funny thing is, after the 25th, on the very next day on the 26th, when everything was peaceful and quiet, the soldiers returned to each side and the war started again. The peace that the world gives will never last like the peace that Jesus brings to you. Because even in this beautiful story, it's nice. You think about it. Inspiring. Cool. They dropped the guns. They left the bombs. And for two days, they held peace. But on the 26th, they immediately went back to fighting, as if nothing happened. But you see, that's the difference between the peace that the world gives and the peace that comes from Jesus Christ. We call him the Prince of Peace. And the reason why you look at this, it also says, I bring you good tidings and what? Peace to all mankind. Isn't that, we're all, isn't that what we're all looking for? Come, let us adore him, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's all stand. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. As we sing this song, I want you to ponder this great gift that we have in Jesus. Amen.